the first rule of the inertia tensor is don't be afraid of the inertia tensor. Uh, serious about that. Um, the word tensor makes you tense. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, it's a whole new mathematical object. You can really get pretty deep with tensors. Um, and so I can imagine where there is just sort of a, uh, it's a big scary unknown and big scary unknowns are scary. Um, and I want you not to think of it that way. So part of what I want to do is just give you a way. I'm going to talk a few different, there's a few different ways to think about the tensor, but I want to give you one way that's maybe not the most correct way, but is a correct enough way that maybe will uh, hopefully make you just not be intimidated by it and just be able to just use it. Okay, so first, it's worth, worth reviewing how we got here. In Physics 151, um, you had the relationship between the angular momentum and the angular velocity was just L equals high omega, right? This is back in your freshman year when you were young, when you still had hope for the future before it all went bad. Um, and in fact, I don't, one of these days I should sit through all of Physics 151 so I know exactly what happens in it. Um, but I suspect what happened is almost always your rotation was just around the z-axis. And so your rotation is around the z-axis. Um, so the angular momentum was in the z-axis uh, almost always. Um, and it was pretty simple. And then you had expressions for angular, not for angular, for a moment of inertia for a bunch of different objects, a disk, a sphere, a hollow sphere, uh, a flat plate, a cube, whatever, a rod around the end, a rod around the middle. And, um, uh, and that's all you had to worry about, moment of inertia. It was a single thing. And you may remember the moment of inertia was, well, you start with a point mass. If you have a point mass, a distance r from the axis of rotation, so that's not r from the origin, but the cylindrical r, um, the moment of inertia of that is just mr squared. And so then for an extended object, it's just you add up mr squared for all the points, which might be an integral, and you can figure out uh, what the moment of inertia of an extended object is. Well, okay. Then in Taylor, at the beginning of this chapter, we saw that what if an object is rotating not around an axis of symmetry, but some other axis? So like instead of a disk happily rotating around the axis perpendicular to its face, what if the disk is rotating, but is tilted? Um, and so here, that omega vector, you would actually have to have something holding it, rotating like that for reasons I'll talk about in a few minutes here. Um, what if that happens? Well, um, on the last video, I did the simple example of just a single point held by a rod at an angle. We saw that the angular momentum vector was not along the omega vector, right? That's the most important observation of um, the beginning of this chapter is that angular momentum and angular velocity do not have to point in the same direction. This is different from regular linear momentum. Linear momentum always points in the direction of velocity because it's a scalar times velocity. Angular momentum doesn't have to. And uh, and we've seen an example where if you work out the angular momentum, um, r cross p, you get something that's in a different direction from the angular velocity. Well, and that's the case here too with this disk. So if I have a disk that is tilted relative to the axis it is rotating around, um, you can calculate and determine that its angular momentum is actually off at an angle like this, right? And how did we figure that out? Well, we had these products of inertia, um, as they were called. Lx is Ixz omega, Ly, Iyz omega, Lz, Izz omega. For this, for these, uh, for this expression here to work, so that Lx, Ly, Lz gives you the three components of the angular momentum. This is for omega along z. All right, and this is where we were before. Um, we had omega along z, but we discovered that the products of inertia uh, were what, what you would get, what you would need to multiply omega by to get the various different components of L. Right, so for this disk, um, let's just take it instantaneously when the disk is oriented um, so that it's tilted about the x-axis. So it has symmetry around the y-axis here. Um, if you calculated Iyz, you would get zero, but Ixz is not zero and izz is still not zero. izz is what we used to just call i. In fact, in the language of the current section, back in Physics 151, you made sure that you were always rotating an object around one of its principal axes. 
right? You were rotating it around, and almost always it was an axis of symmetry. Now, one of the things in this chapter is any old blobby object will have principal axes, even if it's not obvious an axis of symmetry. Everything has three principal axes, at least, like a sphere. Any axis is a principal axis. Um, but the, the maximally random asymmetric object still has three principal axes. But if your object has symmetry, like a cone or a disk or something like that, then the axis of symmetry is going to be one of the obvious principal axes. Um, and you always just were using an axis of symmetry. And so you were always using a principal axis. Well, so here, in this case, the ang the rotation omega is not along a principal axis. So we get components of L that are in other directions. Well, OK, so you could do the same thing in the other way. Suppose um, instead of having omega along the z-axis, which way is L, I wanted to have L along the z-axis, which way is omega, um, or even more generally, if I want to have omega in any old direction, which way is L? Well, it will not surprise you. Now let's start with the first one. That let's suppose we want L along the z-axis, but omega could be any way. It would work out here. So just as before, you had to have one term for each component of L to go with the single z component of omega. Here you have one term for each component of omega to go with the single term of z. Now you have these products of inertia. Notice there is an izx instead of an ixz here. So the first subscript is the component of angular momentum. The second subscript is the component that goes on omega. So this is what the z component of angular momentum would be. And then these products of inertia, how do you calculate them in general? To actually calculate one of these products of inertia, um, you use these expressions here. So this is IZZ which is what you used to just call the moment of inertia, right? So that expression on the top is for discrete particles. That's the one that's in Taylor. It's just the sum of mr squared, whereby r, in this case, I mean the cylindrical r, the distance from the axis of rotation, right? That's what you see here. Assuming if the, um, in izz, uh, this is for an omega that's along the z-axis, really the z component of omega, but for now, omega along the z-axis, and then l along the z-axis, um, then x squared plus y squared is the distance from the z-axis, the axis of rotation there. So that's what you used to call i. Now we're going to make it more general, but it turns out that this one product of inertia is the same as the old moment of inertia. The, the expression on the bottom is the formula used for a continuous object where rho there is the density, mass density of the object as a function of position. Um, and you do that integral, and that'll tell you the moment of inertia. But now we have the other products of inertia. So here is ixz. So this is the one that if you want, had omega along the z-axis, you multiply this by that omega to get the x component of angular momentum. Um, the top one is the discrete. Um, and looking at this, you could very quickly guess what it's going to be for yz and xy, right? Because xz has this x times z on it. Uh, the other thing, looking at this, you can realize that izx and ixz have to be the same as each other because x times z is the same as z times x, and that's how they show up um, in this expression. So that's how you get one of these um, off-axis products of inertia that will give you the x component of angular momentum when omega is along the z-axis. The bottom expression, once again, is for a continuous object with density rho as a function of position, right? Okay, so that's how you calculate these. And if you had omega along any old axis, though, you're going to have uh, you're going to have to consider all components of x, y, and z. So what ends up happening is the x component of angular momentum. Well, you have a product of inertia for the x, y, and z. Three products of inertia, one each. For the x, y, and z components of the angular velocity. Then for the y component of angular momentum, again you have three products of inertia for that you use with the three components of the angular velocity, and likewise for z. So now you see there's nine numbers, and it's like, oh my goodness, that's nine numbers. Eh, don't worry about it, right? If you know how to walk five steps, you know how to walk a mile. And that's an important thing to realize and be comfortable with. Um, we already had three products of inertia. Once we figured out that angular momentum could point in a different direction from angular velocity, we needed these three products of inertia in order to go from, you know, without instead of just calculating it from r cross p and integrating every single time. Um, for a rigid body, you can actually just pre-calculate this 
these products of inertia and just use them. Well, now we've got nine of them. All right. So here is a way to think of the moment of inertia tensor. It is just a way of collecting together these nine products of inertia with the shorthand of matrix times vector math as a way of writing down these three sums here, right? So if you look at this, if I write omega x, omega y, omega z as a column vector, and I write all of my products of inertia in a matrix like this, then my angular velocity column vector is just going to be that matrix times that column vector, right? So this is really not the strict definition of a tensor. And Taylor sort of says the same thing, that real strict definition of a tensor has something to do with properties of rotations. Um, but you can think of it as a collection of nine numbers. Um, it, it's a way of collecting together all these products of inertia with a compact way of writing the math of how you multiply them all together to go from angular velocity in any old direction to angular momentum in any old direction. Um, okay, so um, hopefully it's not that big a deal. That's one way to think about it. And in fact, when I said there's nine products of inertia, remember the IXZ and IZX are the same as each other, which means that this matrix here is a symmetric matrix. So if you take the transpose of it, you get exactly what you started with. So given that IXZ is the same as IZX, there's really only six products of inertia because you get to reuse three of them. The three in, in the upper corner, you can reuse in the lower corner down there. So um, conceptually, there's nine but because of the way they're calculated, there are only six different ones. So you need these six products of inertia um, in order to go from angular velocity to angular momentum. And this allows you to do it um, no matter what orientation you have. Maybe you don't have the freedom to choose a principal axis to rotate about. Um, and if you don't have that freedom, like because your disk is at some angle and it's rotating, then you have to deal with this. By the way, as an aside about this disk here that's rotating, notice the angular momentum is changing as a function of time. Well, okay, if momentum is changing as a function of time, you know there's a force on it because F equals dP dt. Likewise, if the angular momentum is changing as a function of time, you know there's a torque on it because torque is dL dt. So to make this disk rotate like this, there must be a torque on that disk. And not only that, the torque is, is changing in directions all the time. Um, it, but because the angular momentum is moving around in a circle. So the torque is gets sort of like a circular motion. So uh, if you actually think about like holding onto a rod where this disc is rotating, you realize holding onto the rod, it's going to be pulled left and right and forward and back all the time in order to keep that thing rotating. And so by figuring out what that angular momentum is, you can figure out how much torque there's going to be. You can figure out how much force you're going to need on the ends of the rod to keep the torque going. That can tell you things like how far... Uh, tilted can my wheel be on my car before the forces are going to be too much and rotating it too fast is going to cause the, the thing to break apart, right? So sometimes you don't have the freedom to insist on rotation around the principal axis. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you're going to want to choose a coordinate system where the coordinate system is not oriented along the principal axis. Um, and in that case, you need the full tensor. You need all these products of inertia. If you can orient the coordinate system along the principal axis, it's nice when you can do that because then the moment of inertia tensor is diagonal and there's just the IXX, IYY, and IZZ components of it, but the rest can be there. Now, I do want to say a little bit more about tensors to, to dig just slightly deeper into them. Here is another way to think about tensors. Here's a bizarre way to think about a vector. Um, a vector is a function that you feed another vector to, or an operator, a vector is an operator that you feed another vector to to get a scalar. What do I mean by feed? Well, it's what we call the dot product. So what is a vector? A vector, one way of looking at a vector is it's three numbers. And if I multiply those three numbers properly by the right components of a different vector, I get a scalar. Um, when would you want to do that? Well, I don't know. You want to calculate the work that's done by a force F over displacement delta R. So F dot delta R, you can think of the force in that case as a function or an operator that you apply to delta R to get the scalar work out, right? Um, so so uh, Kip Thorne and Roger Blanford wrote this whole thing about general relativity where they talking, you can think about 
a vector is something that has um, input slots and output slots. And the input slot, what can you feed into it? One vector. What do you get on the out? One scalar. Well, a tensor is something that, and here's two different ways of saying it. One is a tensor is something that you could feed two vectors to and get a scalar out. Or it's something you can feed a vector to and get a different vector out. And you'll think, wait, we've already done a thing where you feed a vector to get another vector. That's the cross product. And hey, guess what? Um, it is possible to write the cross product as a three-dimensional matrix. Ugh. What? So it's got x by y by z. In that three-dimensional matrix, you multiply by two vectors and you get a single vector out. Surprise, but that's called the levi chavita tensor. Look it up if you're interested. We're not going to go into it. Um, but this tensor, this moment of inertia tensor here, you can think of it as a thing that you feed a vector, the angular velocity vector, and you get another vector out, the angular momentum vector. And the particular way in which you feed it works out to be exactly the same as matrix multiplication. For the ma so the math of matrix multiplication works out here. Right. So that's maybe another way of thinking about a tensor. Yet another way of thinking about a tensor is, um, right, so a vector has one component for each axis. Um, a tensor, and now we're going to be more specific and call this a rank two tensor. So a rank two tensor is something that you could represent as just a matrix here. A rank two tensor is something that um, for each component, it has one element for each component. OK, maybe that's not the best way to say it. Basically, I mean, what I'm trying to get to is it has an x, 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 y, x, z, y, x, y, 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 z, z, x, z, y, z, z component that it's got two component subscripts and you have to include them all. So a rank three tensor, the only one of which you have ever heard of probably is the Levi Civita tensor because I just mentioned it, has um, uh, can I cube three has 27 components. Right, and I'm not going to say them all, but it has x x x x x y x x z x y x x y y x y z etc. Right, those are all the components of it. Well, all right, so vectors. Go ask any of my students in Physics 141. Vectors are hard and complicated because they add a whole new wealth of stuff that you can do and things to worry about above just regular math with scalars. Um, vectors add direction and dimension to it. Well, tensor is is just another step up. And in fact, in the language, a vector is really just a rank one tensor. So what we're calling the inertia tensor is a rank two tensor. It's just another step up for each vector. You have to have a vector for each component of the vector now. All right. So and then how do you really? All right. So matrix multiplication works for two dimensional uh, rank two tensors. When you get to higher order, you have to start using all sorts of summation notation to handle all of this. But um, we're not going to have to do that in this class. So all of that, all right, so tensors, that's a whole rich thing, but um, don't be afraid of it is the most important lesson. And if you want to think of it as a collection of numbers, a collection of uh, products of inertia oriented in such a way that matrix multiplication gets you the right angular momentum given your angular velocity, that's an okay way to think about it. And so now you can just use it, right? Now you can use it. You have angular velocity in some direction, you can figure out the angular momentum. If you have a rate of change of angular velocity, you can figure out the rate of change of angular momentum. Now, of course, all right, here's the thing. This rotating disk, once again, it's um, inertia tensor. The components of it are not constant in time here. And the rotating reference frame, they would be. But in this reference frame, they're not. Why? Because, well, given that omega is constant in time, but L is not, the other thing in this product L equals moment of inertia tensor dotted uh, angular velocity must not be constant. So it is possible to have a moment of inertia tensor that's changing in time as the object's orientation changes in time. All right, that's all for now. Well, that's not all because I want you to actually watch this. So I brought Novella back. Say hello, Novella. No. Kill him. Oh, yes, there we go. Did you see right?